for life after Christmas is a bit of a struggle for me, I'll admit to you. Um, and part of that's because I love Christmas. I always have. I love so many parts of it. I love the, the decorations inside and out. Um, which, by the way, means if you pair that with the Dutch that's been infused in me over the years of working with lots of Dutch folks in Reformed Church world, this time of year I'm on an eager search for the best clearance deals on Christmas lights. Uh, so if you happen to find any C3 or C6 icicle lights in cool white, not soft white, would you let me know? That would actually help me deliver on some expectations for next year. But, you know, beyond the lights and decorations, I love Christmas for much more than that. I love the biblical stories. I love the songs of worship that come at this time of year. I love the programs, the parties, all of it. If there's a Grinch around here, it's definitely not me. And to be fair, if you were here last week, it's not Michelle either. I said something to that effect. I was wrong. It's, she's not. She was quick to let me know that. Apparently, a few people caught her in the hallways afterwards. But no matter how much I do love Christmas, what I don't love is the inevitable letdown after Christmas. Sooner or later, it always seems to come. Whether it's immediately after, maybe in a home, all the presents are open and all the festivities there are gone, or maybe it's when we're well about, you know, this time of year, in January and beyond, facing these cold winter months. But I think if that feeling of the, this letdown could be summed up in a single picture, it'd be something like this. Take a look at the screen. And just take that in for a second. You're with me on this, right? You know this feeling. Now, to be clear, this is actually not a picture that I took. It's a random picture I found on the internet. Um, but it could be a picture of our house. This is often kind of what it looks like after the mayhem of opening gifts and all that. And that might be different in your home, but I do think this picture kind of sums up that after Christmas letdown feeling. All the anticipation of Christmas has come to its fullness, and now we have to face life after Christmas. It may start with cleaning up a mess like this, but then it means taking down decorations, taking down the exterior Christmas lights, something I often end up doing under a threat of ice and wind, even though it was relatively nice when I put them up, so I wonder why I did that. For me, anyway, it ends up meaning trying to shed the extra weight that all those Christmas treats have added, which is especially tough because during the winter, it seems like more and more I just want to like sleep and eat carbs all the time. That's what the cold does to me. I don't know. It means getting back to the routine of normal life, facing the long, cold months of winter without Christmas. Again, just raise your hand. Are you with me on that? You know what this feels like, right? You kind of understand. Okay, so I don't have to go on from there. That's life after Christmas. And it, life after Christmas can be tough in some ways. But beyond that, I mean, all joking aside and all lamenting and whining aside, there is a measure of excitement that comes from the new year, at least for me. There's an excitement that actually comes with getting back into a good routine, facing new challenges, making progress, and whatever I believe maybe God is calling me to pursue or what we collectively are called to lean into together as we follow his leading, even if that too does include struggle sometimes. All of that is why we're going to be focusing our attention in worship during these next few weeks on just that, life after Christmas. In the gospel accounts, and specifically in the gospel of Luke, the careful reader will notice that Jesus is heralded by angels as the one through whom God's peace on earth will now come. And of course, that's part of what we love about the Christmas stories, and rightfully so. But life after Christmas in Luke's gospel is not all Christmas cookies and eggnog. Far from it. When Jesus is presented at the temple for dedication by Mary and Joseph right after his birth, that's something we looked at actually on Christmas Day this year, one of the people who gives witness to this newborn baby being the Messiah is this impromptu prophet who's at the temple named Simeon. And among his excited proclamations of the fact that this newborn king is the Messiah, he says to Mary these words. He says, This child is destined to call the, cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Those words are a little bit jarring in their context. They're a sobering hint that the peace that Jesus brings will be costly. The peace that Jesus brings will be resisted by some. The peace that Jesus brings will bring with it a measure of pain, even though it is good. And then right after this story of Anna and Simeon in the temple, we see a succession of stories where Jesus is involved in conflict of some sort. Conflict with his earthly parents. Conflict with the devil. Conflict with the people of his hometown. Those are all stories we're going to explore more in depth during this series. 
And then as the story goes on from there, the conflict continues and even escalates. Conflict with more people from his family, more people in various towns who reject him, even if they celebrated him at first. And then even more conflict with the religious leaders, the Roman leaders, and all that, as we probably know, leads to the events of Holy Week, of his unjust trial, of him being arrested, of him being tortured and put to death on a cross on Good Friday. Now, in the reversal of the gospel, that ends up being the source of good news. Resurrection Sunday tells us that that was the path to new life. But still, it was a conflict-ridden way to get there. Now, I don't think the conflict came because Jesus was bored and just wanted to go shake things up a bit, so he decided to go try to pick a fight. Rather, the conflict came because true peacemaking always involves disrupting a false sense of peace. And because that really is just the heart of the matter of what we're going to talk about, I want to make sure you don't miss that. True peacemaking almost always involves disrupting a false sense of peace when that's settled in. And the disruption of that false peace is not really welcomed by all. Thus, all this conflict around the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Now, I just want to acknowledge that for some of us, maybe even many of us, the idea that conflict precedes peace, perhaps even that it is a necessary prerequisite for true peace, can be a bit jarring. It may seem counterintuitive to what we usually think. It may even be something that we really want to dig our heels in and resist. Because many of us define peace as the absence of conflict. So how can this be? Well, I want to answer that first by asking you a different question. What you see on the screen, is this a bridge? You don't have to actually answer. Just think about it. Is that a bridge? I mean, on the one hand, yes, of course it is. It has all the outward appearances of a bridge. It it has footings. It has pillars. It has presumably a strong, stable roadway on top, all of which are built from concrete and look solid enough from here. The obvious problem in this case is that it is a bridge that leads to nowhere. It does not connect one piece of land to another across a chasm. That's the very purpose of a bridge. So in that way, yes, it looks like a bridge. And and it has several features of a bridge. And that may tempt us to say, yeah, of course, look at it. It's a bridge. But it doesn't do the most fundamental thing a bridge is supposed to do. Connect two places across a gap. So should we consider it a true bridge? Now, just so you know, out of fairness to the designers and builders of this particular bridge, when they started out, it wasn't this way. Um, what you see now is a result of a hurricane that rocked the area of Honduras in 1998, and it left the river rerouted, and so it ended up being a bridge to nowhere. But still, hopefully, you see the point. It may look like a bridge, but it doesn't actually do what a bridge is supposed to do. So should we really call it a bridge in the truest and most important sense of that word? So it is, I think, with peace and peacemaking. Something may look like peace on the outside because there's an absence of conflict. But if Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, was heralded just a few weeks ago during Advent as the one through whom peace on earth comes, we would perhaps do well to ask, what is the nature of true peace if he was so surrounded by conflict? I would make the case, according to the the life of Jesus, the wider witness of Scripture, that true peace is best described by the, the word shalom. You may be familiar. That's a word from the Hebrew language, from the Hebrew scriptures, that describes a way of life that gets translated as peace, but has a much richer and fuller sense. It's being at peace with God, at peace with others, at peace with the world around us, even with our very selves that are so often fractured. But if that's the true definition of peace, then what follows is this. True peace can only come when our love is rightly ordered. When we learn to love God and others, and ourselves in right relationship to one another. When those loves get out of order, and they do, it happens to all of us as part of inheriting the human condition of having fallen into sin and being prone to fall back into sin even after we've been given new life in Christ. But when that happens and those loves get out of order, it requires a disruption of the false peace that has settled in and that has allowed it to endure. And then beyond that, it requires the work of Christ's centered reconciliation to restore peace. So that's what we're going to be focusing on during these few weeks. We'll be focusing on how life after Christmas in the Gospel of Luke reveals in the life of Jesus the way to true peacemaking, which may at times be challenging, but it is good. 
A central part of the life of salvation that Jesus came to bring is precisely this, reordering our life and love around him and his kingdom and experiencing the necessary reconciliation with God and others that comes as a result of the damage done when and where things have gotten out of order. Of course, that last part is at the very heart of the gospel message. So we're going to start all that after this admittedly very long introduction to the reading today by reading that story from Luke chapter 2. It begins on page 781 in these Bibles under your chairs. If you want to look it up, we'll have words on the screen as well. But we're going to read that story as a starting point, going from verses 41 through 52. It comes right after the birth and infancy narratives of Jesus in Luke's gospel. Would you stand with me, please, as I read these words? Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41, says this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their friends, or their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them, and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. This is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. God, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that it today would bring peace to us. Begin, perhaps, a new work of peace in our lives as we center ourselves on you, Lord Jesus, and open ourselves to the work of your Spirit. May that be so. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, first of all, I I just really kind of love the humanness that we find in this particular story. And it's the only one in Scripture, by the way, that involves both Mary and Joseph interacting with Jesus beyond those earliest days when he was an infant. I don't think that there is a parent among us who can't identify, at least on some level, with the mixture of relief and guilt and often even anger that all kind of come out in an instant upon finding a child that's been lost track of, even just for a moment or two, much less several days as in this instance. Of course, that's exactly what we see in this very human interaction. We see an accusation almost from Mary leveled at Jesus. How could you do this to your father and me? Implying that it was Jesus' fault alone, or at least primarily his fault, that he was left behind by the family when they left Jerusalem to head back to their hometown. And implying pretty directly that this was not a very good way for Jesus to honor his father and mother, as the law commands. And by the way, like you might have picked up from the reading there, it was likely a large group of extended family who traveled to, to Jerusalem for the festival, and then back Oftentimes they would travel in ways that were broken up by um, gender. So the men would perhaps travel together and the women and then the children kind of uh, all together in a mix. So it's maybe easier to understand why an immediate family of three could have gone on without the one who was left behind. Now there may be a measure of truth in Mary's claim that Jesus stayed behind on purpose. But no doubt there was also a level of diverted guilt in her statement as well. Mary knew full well that it was as much her and Joseph's fault as anyone that he ended up being left behind. Now, I won't go into all the details here, but it's not coincidental that Jesus is 12 years old when this story takes place. Because that was, and it still is in many places, right around this age that young men in Jewish families and communities come of age and become a son of the law or son of the commandment. It's often around age 12 or maybe now officially 13. But that's what the word bar mitzvah means, a son of the commandment, son of the law. It's a changing of legal status, and it's a recognition of their spiritual inheritance of the Torah, the law of God. So it's one of those phrases that has kind of a double meaning. Now in this case, in case it isn't clear, this means that Jesus was in the course of development, humanly speaking, that we affectionately call adolescence. 
Meaning he was almost certainly beginning to be an apprentice to his human father, Joseph, in the family business of carpentry, yet he was establishing his own unique identity as well. And regardless of the culture, I think the push and the pull and the presence of regular conflict between emerging adults and their parents is pretty nearly universal. Now, oftentimes that conflict is just because of the handing off of the baton of control and responsibility. It's often bumpy. It's difficult. Going from dependence to relative independence, humanly speaking, is hard. Plus, as the parent of any teenager will tell you, the hormones don't help things much. Makes it a little difficult. But beyond that, it's often further strained by the unwillingness of a parent to begin to relinquish the sense of control that's slipping away, inevitably, and yet they insist on their own will remaining primary. Now, sometimes, of course, it's much more complicated than that, and that whole thing is very tough. But in this instance, that does seem to be part of what's going on. Perhaps you noticed in the dialogue that what's at the heart of this conflict is whose will Jesus is going to primarily submit to. That is, which father's will. Mary essentially says, how could you do this to your father and me? And Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Or as one translation puts it, to draw out the nuance of the text a little bit more and even allude to that apprenticeship, to the family business that would have been going on, it says, didn't you know that I would have to be getting involved in my father's work? Now, based on the infancy narrative that comes right before this, I'm sure that although this passage says that Mary and Joseph didn't understand in the moment what he was saying, eventually the reminder of the identity of Jesus' true father hit home for them even if perhaps it had faded from their memory in the 12 years that had passed since the earlier narratives and what we just read. They're side by side in our Bible, but 12 years passed in that time. Now, at this juncture, we actually could take an entire deep dive, and perhaps we would sometime, into the complex world of navigating well life between parents and emerging adults, or parents and full-grown adults, for that matter. But while we're not going to do a deep dive right now, I do want to note one very important thing here. While Jesus did make the ordering of his love and loyalty very clear, he was prioritizing the will of his Father in heaven above all else, that did not mean he cast aside the commandment to honor his father and mother, humanly speaking. The conclusion of what we read makes it really clear that he returned to Nazareth with them and he was indeed obedient to them. Now in this instance, being obedient to his parents was apparently not in conflict with being obedient to his Father in heaven. But for us there may well be times when that is the case. As a matter of fact, later on in the story of the Gospels, that was the case for Jesus too. But still, even when that's true, even when being obedient to God may involve not yielding to our parents' will later in life, that does not give us the right or excuse to ignore the command to honor our father and mother. Now again, I, I won't go into great detail here, but I heard it said once in a way that deeply impacted me because of my own story of growing up, I heard it said that for some of us, honoring our father and mother is the longest journey we will ever take, and it is the hardest work we will ever do to find the appropriate way in which, the appropriate weight with which to honor our father and mother. And I think that statement is just profoundly perceptive, and it's deeply true but despite the difficulty that may come with that for some of us, doing it, nonetheless, honoring our father and mother is a necessary part of obedience to God and experiencing the fullness of the life of salvation that Jesus offers us as we follow him. Now again, while there's much more we could explore there, I, I want to really cut to the heart of the matter in this story that takes us from the particular conflict involved that comes with peacemaking that we see in this story, the conflict between Jesus and his earthly parents. And I want to really cut to the heart and the more universal application of that, that each one of us has to reckon with at some level, which is this. Being obedient to the will of God will at times mean disappointing or even angering others who have a will or agenda of their own for us. And I say that even though I tell you, I wish that wasn't true. I really do. I wish I could tell you something different. I don't love conflict. Sometimes I much prefer the relative ease and comfort of false peace compared to the hard work of true, true peacemaking. But I gotta tell you, I think it is true. I'm convinced it's inevitable that if we are to faithfully follow Jesus, 
eventually that will happen. In fact, Jesus made this clear later on that this is how it would work. In a moment of verbal hyperbole later on to make this point, he once said, don't think I've come to bring peace, at least not in that false peace sense. I've come to bring a sword, he said. For those who would you know, seek to, to love God as the first among ordered loves, to seek his kingdom above all else, a person's enemies, Jesus said, may well end up being in their own household. It's part of what he said in Matthew 10. I want to pause here in the midst of making this point to make a very important clarification. Never should we allow ourselves to be deceived into believing that it's okay to forsake the way of Jesus and our pursuit of faithfulness to him and his word. That is, it's not okay to abandon the way of selfless, humble, and sacrificial love and kindness in favor of a seemingly more expedient route like the path of cruelty or brute force or meanness, just because we're certain that our cause is justified. Now, sometimes in the case of physical protection of innocence, if it's really complicated, I get that. But that's not my main point. My main point is, if the way to conquer evil and bring peace was through brute force, then Jesus would have brought his kingdom the way that the emperors and countless kings down through the ages tried to bring theirs. But he did not do that. And since the medium is the message, that is the way in which the kingdom of God comes, is perhaps the most powerful expression of what the kingdom of God is all about to begin with. Let's make sure we never lose sight of that. It is not okay to forsake the way of Jesus in our pursuit of faithfulness to him or to his word. And I feel compelled to say that because while I think that's always been a temptation natural to the human condition, as I right now look at the world around us and often especially Christians engagement within it it seems like that temptation is an especially strong one right now that we are prone to caving to and that point actually brings me to the last thing I want to say this morning something that comes directly from this story that we read and that gives us what I think is sort of a non-negotiable for any pursuit of true peacemaking according to the way of Jesus and rightly ordering our loves And by the way, it's a fairly familiar line for me. So I'm sorry to disappoint you if you're looking for something new and novel this new year. Simply this, we we must be diligent in our study of Scripture. We must always seek to be immersed in the story of Scripture. If we want to be compelled by the goodness and the beauty of Jesus and his kingdom and know with any sense of clarity what his will is, what his way is compared to others that may be imposed upon us. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus was doing exactly that when Mary and Joseph found him in the temple, studying, reflecting, questioning, wrestling with the word of God. Now I get that sometimes it can seem a little bit intimidating, really I do, to to dive into the world of the Bible, to immerse ourselves in the story of scripture. But let me just offer this briefly, something we said before. It does not have to be an all or nothing kind of a thing. Any reading and reflecting and understanding of Scripture that we gain, imperfect or incomplete as it is, individuals, families, small groups as a church, whatever, any of that that we gain is better than the reading and reflecting that we don't do, the understanding and insight that we don't gain. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And of course, there are various classes and opportunities that come up here that we try to offer to help in that endeavor, and I hope that we continue to offer more. And I always would want to point you towards the Bible Project as an amazing tool to help you, especially individuals or families or small groups, to dig deeper on your own. But the bottom line is this. If we believe that the Bible is both the written record of God's saving work in the world and his current instrument of that saving work here and now in our lives, and if we believe that God has uniquely revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus and the pages of Scripture of the Old and New Testaments and the path to true peacemaking, must be paved with this, committing to know and live by the story of Scripture, to immerse ourselves in its story. Because there will always be competing stories fed to us in some way or other, tempting us to give our life and love to them instead, to give the very best to some other pursuit besides the kingdom of God as Jesus revealed it. And while sometimes... Honestly, it may just seem safer and easier by comparison to just go with those stories. Just take them, live by them, give up the resistance. I think deep down, our hearts long for something deeper 
than the counterfeits that were offered. Long for something more than they can offer. I think we know this intuitively, that it would be a false sense of peace to do that, to just cave and go with them. And so as we begin this new year, may we immerse ourselves in the story of Scripture. May we recommit ourselves to that endeavor, fixing our eyes on Jesus and on his kingdom so that we may live as true peacemakers. The kinds of people that Jesus said, by the way, will be called children of God, bearing a family resemblance in life and love to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. May that be so. Let's pray together. Oh God, I thank you for the disruption that I know this sort of thing is for me personally. The call to follow you faithfully, always in love and gentleness and humility and kindness, always first starting on the inside, acknowledging and confessing to you the ways in which I have adopted a false sense of peace. I need to turn my heart with fresh eyes towards you and your kingdom. Receive again the grace so generously and freely offered by you to me. Thank you for all of that, that you are our Prince of Peace. May I, may we surrender our lives to you and your kingdom once again. May that be so. Amen.